Well, uh, good morning everyone and a very warm welcome to our service here this morning. Uh, to everyone, uh, especially uh, visitors that we have with us, and especially also to the Reverend Samuel McCollum for taking our service today. Now, uh, announcements. Session and committee meet at 8 p.m. this Tuesday in the main hall. Now, that's a very important meeting. Uh, there's important decisions to be made in the light of the upcoming events when our new minister is ordained and installed, and also regarding the manse refurbishment. So, Tuesday night, 8 o'clock in the main hall. Wednesday, uh, midweek, again, we would ask for a good attendance, and everyone is really welcome along to that. Uh, Friday, uh, the men's group will be meeting jointly with the Churchtown men's group in our hall here at 8 p.m. So that's for the men's group. Then on Saturday, the EMF conference is in Balamoni, 10.30 to 1.30, and the Reverend David McCulloch has taken part. There's a notice in the vestibule there with more details on that. Uh, Go team applications uh, are currently been requested, especially for Stran Rar, which uh, will begin the 14th of April. Next Sabbath, the preacher will be the Reverend Philip Moffat for the morning and evening services, and those will be his um, final addresses here from the pulpit as our interim moderator, so be there if you possibly can. Also, there is a uh, week of prayer leaflets being left in the pews there and uh, Reverend McCollum will say a bit more on that. Uh, then most importantly Friday week the 1st of April 7.30 ordination and installation of Mr John Coulter as our new minister. The official invites have gone out although uh, we need to be uh, careful of overall numbers but If you have friends that you would especially like to invite to that installation and uh, ordination and installation, you need to get them in the right way around. If you have friends that you especially want to invite, feel free to do so. And we expect to be able to accommodate all. Could the ladies please wait behind after church for a brief meeting regarding finalising catering? for that installation on the Friday um, Friday week. So that's at the end of this service. Ladies, please wait behind. Now, uh, there's an official... Uh, finally here, there is an officially... We have to read the edict. Um, this is to be read at the, on two Sabbaths prior to the ordination and installation of your minister. That word edict, I was bemused a bit by it. It's not a word we use very much. And the definition, according to the Cambridge uh, Dictionary, is it's an official order or proclamation by someone in authority, especially one that is given in a forceful and unfair way. So I don't think that this installation will be forceful or unfair in any way. So here, here goes, here's the edict. Whereas the call of this congregation to Mr. John Coulter has been, been sustained as a regular call and has been accepted by him, Presbytery hereby gives notice that it will meet at Drumbulg on the first day of April 2022 at 7.30 p.m., to ordain and install him to the pastorate of the congregation by order of the presbytery. Um, I see there, moderator James Blair, clerk Edward McCollum, and that's dated the 15th of March. So I'll treat you all to that next week again. Okay, so with that, I'll hand over to uh, Reverend McCollum.
Well, good morning. It's uh, lovely to travel here this morning in the lovely sunshine and to see the beauty of the countryside. And uh, we rejoice in the opportunity we have in meeting together now to join together in worship. And so we're going to begin our service as we turn to God's Word to sing from Psalm 95. The Psalm 95, the stanzas 1 to 5. And the tune is Jackson number 102. And here is our call to worship. O come and let us to the Lord in songs our voices raise. With joyful shouts let us the rock of our salvation praise. And then it goes on to speak about coming with thanksgiving. To meet him with our thanks. Let us approach before his face. It's always good to have that awareness that we have so much to return our thanks to the Lord for that we, we come to, to thank him and to, to praise him. And we're reminded that he is a great God. Stanza 3, the Lord's a great God and great King. Above all gods he is, in whose hand are the depths of the earth, the mountain peaks are his. Indeed, the whole world, everything belongs to him. And we too have come from his hand. We have been given life by him. And he has graciously sustained that life to this moment. And so we're called, O oh, come and let us worship him. Let us bow down to you. Come, let us kneel before the Lord, who is our maker true. Psalm 95, we sing the stanzas 1 to 5. Let's stand as we sing praise. Let us join together in prayer. Let us all pray. O Lord God Almighty, we come together into your presence with praise and worship. We acknowledge you to be the only true God, the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These three persons who yet are so united together that you're only one God. And we praise you for all the perfection of your being. We thank you for all of your mercies to us, that you have spared us to see this Lord's day and enabled us to come together in this place to worship you. We thank you for the, the beauty of the world around us this morning, for the sunshine, for the Evidences of new life, of the, the spring are coming and the, the winter are being passed once more. And we see that you are the God who is faithful. You have promised that while the earth remains, there would be the, the seed time and the harvest. And uh, we see that coming to pass with the passing of the seasons each year. And we acknowledge that you are the faithful God. But Lord, as we draw near to you, we are conscious of our own sin and unworthiness. Lord, we uh, know that we have sinned against you in the things that we have said at times, things that we have done that we ought not to have done, and the duties and responsibilities that were ours that we have left undone. And Lord, we, we know that among all this, we have failed to love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength as we ought to love you. And Lord, we seek forgiveness for our sin. We seek that forgiveness not on the basis of anything that we can do for you, but rather we seek forgiveness on the basis of what Christ has done. And we thank you that at every point where we have failed, he did not fail. We thank you for that perfect life he lived here on earth. We thank you there was never a moment when he did not love the Lord his God with all of his being. We thank you that there was not a, a command of God that he broke. We thank you for a law perfectly kept by our Saviour. And Father, we thank you that 
when he died upon the cross, it was not for his own sin, but rather for our sin that he took to himself and counted as his. And we thank you that he has borne the punishment for that so that all who believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And we thank you that alongside of him taking the punishment for our sin, his perfect righteousness is set to our account. And as we draw near looking unto him today, you see us as perfect, righteous, and holy because we are joined to Christ, because we are hidden in him. And so we praise you for our Savior. And Lord, we ask that if there are any here today who have not come to embrace this Savior for themselves, that you might open their eyes to see their need, that you might stir their hearts by your Spirit and give them a desire to be right with you and enable them to repent and to believe in the Lord Jesus and so be saved. Lord, we pray that you would bless as we turn now to read your word, as we further sing praise and bring our petitions before you. We ask that you would give us the enabling help of your Holy Spirit. We ask it all in our Savior's name and for his glory. Amen. I would ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke's Gospel. We're going to read in Luke chapter 4. I'm reading the first uh, 13 verses. This short account about uh, the temptation of our Lord and how he was here tested. Luke chapter 4 beginning at verse 1. Uh, let's give our attention to the reading of God's Word. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Amen. We pray that God will bless to us this reading from his word. In a moment we Join in singing praise again, turning to Psalm 66. Uh, it's the A selection of the Psalm, and we're singing the stanzas marked 5 to 9. And then uh, after the, we sing this portion, we uh, join together in prayer again. I do draw your attention to the prayer letter that has been prepared by the Mission Committee for this week of prayer, uh, and you will see that it uh, gives matters for thanksgiving and for prayer for each day during this week. And uh, 
I'm sure you'll realize that many of these things, uh, they don't run out in a week's time. Uh, and so we encourage you to, to make sure you have a copy of this uh, and make use of it uh, daily for the coming weeks and uh, to, to pray for different areas of uh, mission work and uh, the wider work of God's kingdom. Uh, and uh, as we think of that, you, you'll see that for today it uh, suggests a matter of giving thanks for the work of the Women's Fellowship and the part played by the Missionary Prayer Letter in keeping us informed of RP works in the wider world, and to give thanks for the work of the Relief Committee, uh, both at home and abroad. And uh, I know the, the Relief Committee have put out a, an appeal for funds for the Ukraine, and they've already sent on, uh, I think it's several thousand pounds they've already sent to a pastor in Romania that they have contact with uh, to help him uh, and his congregation in ministering uh, to uh, refugees from the Ukraine. And so, as we give thanks for the, the work of the Relief Committee, we remember to, to pray for that and pray for the whole situation in the Ukraine. And then you'll see a number of matters there for prayer uh, outlined for today. Pray for work and witness uh, in uh, Bangalore and in India, for the congregations in Spain. Pray for Mary McCollum in South Africa and for Ethiopia. So I do encourage you to make use of this, and uh, we'll, we'll be following through some of those prayer points uh, in our, our prayer uh, in a few moments. But first we're singing praise, uh, Psalm 66, the tune we use is Converse, number 257, and we're singing the stanzas 5 to 9, beginning there at the bottom of page 136. Bless our God, O all you peoples, let his praises loudly sound. He has kept our souls still living, placed our feet on solid ground. And of course for the believer that solid ground is the Lord Jesus that we stand firm on what he has done and know that we're accepted because of that. But then the next stanza speaks of God testing us and trying us uh, and bringing uh, difficult situations into our lives. And we'll be thinking a bit about that uh, later uh, and uh, how the Lord will, will sustain uh, through the midst of trouble. So we sing praise Psalm 66 from stanza 5 through to 9 and then afterwards remain standing as we join in prayer. Let's stand to sing praise. Let us join together in prayer. Let's all pray. O Lord, as we draw near to you in prayer, we come with thankfulness for all of your mercies and kindness to us. We know that you have uh, been gracious to us, abundantly providing for us. And as we uh, think of the wider work of mission of our church, we thank you for the work done by the Women's Fellowship and the part uh, the ladies play in uh, putting the missionary prayer letter together to keep us informed of the uh, RP witness and mission uh, throughout our own land and further afield. And Lord, we pray that you would be pleased to bless in the, the ongoing work among the women throughout our denomination, that they will be built up in faith and holiness and continue to be a great blessing to the denomination. We give you thanks too for the work of the Relief Committee. We thank you for those who over the years have given themselves to being involved in some of the practical projects that they have uh, given themselves to. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the work that is done at present in providing uh, financial support for refugees from the Ukraine. We thank you for the, the money that has already been sent on to the pastor in Romania. And we pray for him and his congregation as they... Uh, work with uh, refugees fleeing from Ukraine. And we pray, Lord, that they will not only be able to show uh, practically the love of Christ by uh, providing material things and food and clothing and so on, 
But we pray that also they will take opportunities to present the good news of the gospel who are, to people who are passing through. And so we pray, Lord, that many of these refugees who have had to flee from their homes will, in fleeing from their homes, come to find something far greater and far more wonderful as they come to, to hear about the Lord Jesus and come to believe in him. Lord, we do pray for the, the war in the Ukraine, that that will uh, soon uh, subside uh, and that peace would be established. We pray for justice to be done. We pray, Lord, that you will uh, deal with wicked men and bring them down as you have promised you will in your word. And Lord, we, we pray that you would, in your mercy, be very near to believers, uh, those in Ukraine and in the surrounding countries. We pray that you will help them to be bearing good witness for you. Uh, and so, Lord, we pray too that you would help us to know what our response should be. And uh, we thank you for the, uh, those who have already indicated a willingness to house refugees in their own homes. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us all to, to think about what responsibility we have in this area. Father, we thank you for uh, the uh, work that is being done in South Africa by Mary McCollum. We pray your blessing upon her as she works there in the uh, George Academy. And uh, we pray that you will uh, use her witness that the girls that she has contact with will be, be helped, that those who are believers will be built up in their faith. And we pray that there will be others brought to faith. And so be with Mary and those who work alongside her and bless their work and witness there. Lord, we, we pray too for uh, the situation in Ethiopia. We pray for peace there. We pray for protection and food for Christians in that land. And we thank you for the, the witness of our own denomination there in years past. And we, we pray, Lord, that you will uh, still prosper the work among your people in Ethiopia. And then, Lord, as we have been thinking of further afield, we come to think of the, the needs here in Drumbog. And we thank you again for your mercies. And we, we pray your blessing upon John and Deborah and Daniel as they settle into this community. We pray your blessing upon the ordination and installation service on Friday week. And we pray that John will know your help as he ministers here in weeks to come and in, in the months and years ahead. We pray, Lord, that there will be people built up in their faith, that there will be those who are on the fringes drawn in. There will be people in the community uh, contacted and brought in and joined to the fellowship here. We pray, Lord, that you will prosper your work for the glory of your name. And Lord, we, we commit to you any in the congregation who are not able to uh, join with us in worship today, uh, any suffering particularly with uh, physical weakness and frailty. We pray that they may be spiritually strong and that you might revive them and, and strengthen them uh, and restore those who are ill. And so, Lord, you know all the needs. We commend them all to you and seek your blessing. And Lord, now we ask that you would give us your help as we turn again to read your word and consider it together. For we ask it in our Saviour's name and for his glory. Amen. Well, I would ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to uh, the Old Testament, to the book of Genesis, to Genesis chapter 12. And we're going to uh, take up our reading at verse 10. Uh, the first uh, nine verses, you'll recall, uh, are God's call to Abraham uh, to, to set off and go, uh, in a sense, to where he doesn't know God wants him to go, but he, he goes out uh, in obedience uh, to the call of God. And we, we want to take up our reading now at verse 10 uh, and read through from chapter 12, verse 10, through to chapter 13 at verse 4. So Genesis chapter 12, beginning at verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while, because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. 
When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maid servants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. <clears throat> so Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Amen. We pray that God will bless to us this reading from his word. This morning I want us to think for a time about this incident that we have just read of in the life of Abram. Abram is one of the great heroes of the faith and he sets before us a, a great example of the life of faith. But one of the most encouraging things about the Bible is the way in which it is so honest about the failures of the heroes of the faith. These great men and women of faith were men and women just like us. And while by and large they set us a great example of faith and commitment, there were times when they messed up, just as you and I do. And that is what we see in the section that we're looking at uh, today. We see Abraham's faith falters, and he acts sinfully. Uh, and that is both a warning and an encouragement to us. So let's come to our, to our text here from Chapter 12 at verse 10 through to verse 4 of the next chapter. And the first thing we take note of is faith tested. Faith tested. Remember what has happened. In the earlier part of the chapter, the Lord has called Abram to leave his country, his people and his father's household, and go to the land that he would show him. And Abraham had done that. He had separated himself from his native country and his native people. And he has moved into this strange land. It's a bit like John and Deborah moving into a strange land. Well, Abraham has given up so much now to follow the Lord. And now surely great blessing will follow. Isn't that what we tend to think. You may think, I've been refusing to work on the Sabbath. I've obeyed God by, by making that a principle that I'll not take a job that would involve Sabbath work. So surely he will honor me by providing employment for me by or by helping me even to, to gain promotion in the work that I have. Or maybe we say, I, I've obeyed God by not entering into a relationship with an unbeliever. 
So surely God will provide a Christian husband or a Christian wife for me. Or, or someone might say, I've given up all kinds of things to move here to serve God. Surely things will go well for me now. And maybe Abraham would have been thinking that. I have left home at the command of God. Things will go well. Then verse 10 would come as a shock. Now there was a famine in the land. Here was Abraham faithfully following the Lord. And trouble comes. Imagine what must have gone through his mind. Was he saying, I came all the way out here for this? I thought this was to be a land of blessing. Think too of how others might have made fun of him and his God. You can imagine the people back in Ur making fun of him when they heard from some passing traveler that Abraham was living in Canaan in the midst of a famine. And the people might have said, Ah, oh, Abraham, what a foolish man. Imagine leaving here to go and live there. And now he's in the middle of a famine. What a foolish man. How stupid can you get? And of course, that is the kind of thing that people can say about Christians when they follow the Lord. A young man gives up a promising career. To study for the ministry. He's foolish. What prospects he had. Why? Why would he give it up? People just don't understand. And sometimes it's not just unbelievers. Who can make that kind of comment. Sometimes it may be the reaction of professing believers. To other Christians who are more zealous. And have greater vision. But. Some believers are saying, oh, you know, you're, you're going over the top a wee bit. Just hold back. You're, you're not wise in what you're suggesting. And so here is Abraham obeying the Lord. And this test comes. How is he going to respond? Uh, and it draws attention to the fact that as Christians we will face frequent tests. Situations of difficulty and hardship where life isn't all plain sailing. Where things don't work out just as we would have liked. We will have our own equivalent of a famine in the land. And that famine, that crisis may come even when you are living in obedience to the Lord. It may come even soon after you have taken a particular stand for the Lord. But this is what our Lord promised. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So what sort of famines may we have that will come to test our faith? What sort of trials may come? It could be a famine of friends. Perhaps for some of the younger folk, maybe move to a new situation. Maybe going to study or to work in a new area. And you find you have no Christian friends. Uh, and that can be really tough. You've got to, to stand and make your own decisions. A famine Oh, in your health, perhaps. And in a sense, that's one that nearly all of us, uh, it's inevitable that we will have those challenges that come because of physical health problems. It may come when you're relatively young. But inevitably, if you get older, there come those aches and pains and other health problems the challenge you. How do I respond to this? It could be some situation in your employment that brings a real test of your faith. 
You could be passed over for promotion. You could have lies told about you. You could be made redundant. If you worked for P&O this last week, you might have been made redundant. You can have that TB test. It takes your hair down. And you wonder, why has this happened? Well, it's a test of your faith. It could be bereavement or some other tragedy. The list is, is really endless. All kinds of things can really test our faith. And the test may come when we have been doing so well. Maybe we have been on a spiritual high at a church camp or conference or, or in a go team. And we come back to the routine and the very next day something confronts us that it's a real test for our faith. Faith tested. Every Christian can expect of his faith tested by hard times. One writer says, there will be frequent tests in our Christian lives. This is really the only way we'll grow. We tend to stand still when we do not face struggles and problems. Expect them. Some of these tests God brings directly into our lives because he wants to teach us and to prepare us for a greater work for him. So we thought about Abraham's faith tested. But next we see Abraham's faith faltering. Abraham's faith faltering. How did Abraham respond to the famine? What are we told Abraham did? Well, he went down to Egypt. But perhaps more significantly, we should ask, what are we not told he did? Well, we're not told that he looked to the Lord for guidance and direction in this situation. Well, you might say, was going down to Egypt wrong? Well, not necessarily. And do note that going down to Egypt is not to be equated with abandoning God. Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. But he had every intention of returning. But Abram failed to consult the one who had led him to Canaan. He headed for Egypt, which is a land noted for its fertility and abundance. Now, of course, going to Egypt wasn't necessarily wrong. It was, in many ways, a logical step geographically and economically. In fact, on other occasions, Egypt became a place of survival and refuge for God's children. It was also in Egypt where Joseph, many years later, was used by God to provide food for his brothers and his aging father when they too faced a famine in Canaan. And maybe most significantly, Egypt became a place of refuge for Jesus Christ when Herod attempted to snuff out his life when he was but a babe. And so going to Egypt was not in itself the problem. Rather, the, the central issue here is Abram taking matters into his own hands, going down to Egypt without consulting God, the one who had brought him into the land in the first place. And so this was very much his own decision. He was depending on himself and his own quick thinking. He was depending on the things of this earth rather than God. And aren't we all guilty of doing that at times? A problem arises And we try to deal with it from our own resources without looking to God. And it's all too easy for us to slip into the approach where we muddle through by ourselves most of the time. And we only turn to God in the major crises of life. Well, friends, that is not the life of faith. And when we begin to live in that way, 
It is little wonder that God brings major crises into our lives because he wants to teach us that we have got to depend on him all the time. All the time. Not just for the big things, but for those little things as well. And when we don't look to God for the little everyday things that it seems we can manage okay by ourselves, we rob God and we rob ourselves. You see, when we do it by ourselves, we rob God by not returning our thanks to him for the way in which he has provided for us in those little everyday things. Because if we have adopted the attitude, I can do it myself, well, why then should I thank God when I do manage to do it? If I don't do it in conscious dependence on him, then I'm not going to be returning thanks to him. But then we also, when we do it ourselves, rob ourselves because we deny ourselves the blessing of seeing God answer our prayers and perhaps answer them in a most remarkable way. I want you to think for a moment what might have happened if Abraham had turned to God for guidance in this famine situation. Well, it's possible that God would have sent him to Egypt anyway. But with a a specific strategy how to face the problems that he might encounter there. Or with the assurance that that Pharaoh uh, and his officials would not uh, touch Sarah. That he didn't have to fear about that. That might have been God's plan. But it's also possible that God might have provided for Abraham in an altogether different way. Think about how God did provide for his people in subsequent years. Remember how he provided for his people in the wilderness. Manna from heaven. He could have done that for Abram and Canaan during the time of famine. He provided for his people quail as well and water from the rock. Remember in the time of Elijah, how God provided for him the ravens bringing bread and meat morning and evening, the widow's uh, barrel of of meal that never ran out. What amazing miracles of provision God made for his people. That's what he was to do for his people at a later time. So who knows what he might have done For Abram at this point. But we don't know because Abram didn't look to God. He began to walk by sight rather than by faith. And so Abram decided to go down to Egypt. But he foresees certain problems. And again he tries to deal with them by himself. He's conscious that his wife Sarah is a beautiful woman. And that in order to have her, the Egyptians might well kill him. It was standard procedure in those days for men to secure women as their wives by murdering their husbands and previous possessors. Abraham's solution here was to pass Sarah off as his sister. So that rather than be killed on her account, he would be well treated for her sake. And notice that Abram's plan here works a treat. Just as he predicted when he came to Egypt, we read in verse 14, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maid servants and camels. Now take a moment to think about all of this. God had called Abram to leave his family, to leave his homeland, and go to the country that he would show him. 
So Abraham left as the Lord had told him to do. And what happened? There was a famine in the land. Then Abraham decides to take things into his own hands. He goes down to Egypt. He tells lies about Sarah. And the result is that he acquires sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants, maid servants, and camels. In other words, to put it bluntly, we could say when he obeys God, famine comes. When he ignores God and follows his own plan, he prospers. Now that fact warns us against being too simplistic in equating obedience to God with blessing. Yes, trusting God and obeying him and following where he leads is best and always brings blessing. But that blessing may not always be immediately apparent and should not be equated with worldly prosperity. Think about what Abraham did here. In order to save his own skin, he was willing to give up his own wife, willing for her to be taken into Pharaoh's palace and in due course into his bed. That's what this great hero of the faith did. We may be appalled by that. We, we should be appalled by that. But friends, it shows us the depths to which any one of us may sink. I wonder how Abraham felt after Sarah had been taken to Pharaoh's palace. Did he sleep soundly that night? Or did he spend a sleepless night wondering what was happening to Sarah? We don't know. We're not told. But surely at some point, Abraham must have realized the awful mess he had got himself into. Yes, he was acquiring wealth, but would he ever get his wife back again? How could God's promise of numerous descendants be fulfilled now that Sarah had been taken into Pharaoh's palace? Did there come that moment of realization when, when it dawned on Abraham and he thought to himself, Oh dear, I've really messed up. I wonder did he even come to the point to think, Well, God will not want anything to do with me anymore. Aren't we all like Abraham at times, going our own way, doing our own thing. And sometimes it seems to work out great. And yet the reality can be that we're just making a mess of our lives. And sometimes when we come to our senses and realize what we have done, the devil wants us to despair. He wants us to think that God will have nothing more to do with us. I wonder have you ever been there? Have you as it were gone down to Egypt. Gone your own way. Departed from God's way. In your efforts to get on in life. You've gone and done your own thing. And ignored God. Maybe someone here is doing that right now. That's your course of life. Well you know it won't work. The more you go on your way, the bigger the mess will be. But friends, don't despair. For we're told in Scripture where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And that is what we see here. We've seen Abraham's faith tested. And we've seen his faith faltering. But then thirdly, we see God's grace recovering the situation. God's grace recovering the situation. God's continued patience and faithfulness in the lives of his children is often amazing. This is particularly true when God selects someone to achieve a, a special purpose. Well, no purpose was more special 
than the one God chose Abraham to help him achieve. The salvation of mankind. And in spite of Abraham's failures, God brought judgment upon upon Pharaoh for his sins. God caused Pharaoh to return Sarah to Abraham uh, without having defiled her. God even allowed Abraham to keep the servants and animals which Pharaoh had given him on account of Sarah. In fact, Abraham was actually escorted out of Egypt back to Canaan where he belonged. God used pagan people to get Abraham back on the right track. How kind and gracious God is. Abraham messes up and God gets him out of the mess and back where he should be. And when you and I get it wrong, when we mess up, God is just the same. He is so gracious and kind. We don't deserve it, of course. But that is what grace is all about. Undeserved favor. And that is God's speciality. And if you are in your own particular Egypt just now, would you not ask God to deliver you from it? Would you not acknowledge your sin and ask him to forgive you and sort out the mess of your life? And if you do, that will result in what we see here in Abraham. And what we see finally is faith starting afresh. And I think that is the significance of the opening verses of chapter 13. Abram comes up out of Egypt with his wife and all that he has. He travels on until he comes to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he had first built an altar. There, Abram called on the name of the Lord. Here's a new beginning. Abram coming again to worship And acknowledge his God. And how often that's what we need to do. We need to come to God confessing our sin. We need to come asking for forgiveness. We need to come with a renewed commitment to following him wherever he leads. And we are to do that remembering that that forgiveness is possible because of the Lord Jesus. We read earlier in Luke's gospel of our Lord's temptation. How the Spirit took him out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. His faith was tested. But it did not falter. He never sinned. And then on the cross, he died as if he had been a sinner. Bearing the punishment for your sin and mine. So that as we believe in him, we can be forgiven. We can be set right with God. And for all our our failures, we can come again and say, Lord, forgive me and help me to walk as I ought to walk, to live uprightly before you. And God is gracious. He is ready to forgive. Ready to, as it were, wipe the slate clean and let you start afresh with him. May we each commit to doing that again today. Commit ourselves afresh to the Lord. And seeking his mercy and grace to walk in his ways. Amen. Let us bow as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the God of grace. And we thank you that in the scriptures we have these wonderful accounts of the heroes of the faith. And yet we thank you, Lord, that you have given us the account of their failures as well as the account of their successes. 
Because that brings home to us the, the reality that they are just like us. They were frail men and women, just as we are frail men and women. And we thank you for your abounding grace. We thank you that with Christ there is forgiveness. Through him there's forgiveness. That we can be forgiven because he took the punishment for us. And we can be counted righteous because he lived that perfectly righteous life. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity for this congregation of a, a fresh start. And we pray that you will abundantly bless in months and years to come. That your people here will grow in grace and in the love of the Savior. And all to the praise and honor and glory of Christ our great King. In whose name we pray. Amen. We conclude our service as we sing to God's praise from Psalm 121. Psalm 121. And we sing the, the whole psalm. It's the A selection on page 318. And the tune is Lloyd number 109. I to the hills will lift my eyes, from where will come my aid? My aid comes only from the Lord, who heaven and earth has made. So when we come to those situations of testing and trying in our lives, this is where we turn. We turn to the Lord. We look to him to, to aid us, to guide and direct us. And we're given that assurance of his loving care over his people, that he will watch over and protect them in all their going out and coming in. Sam the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.